Professor Sidney White Crawford is the Willa Cather Professor of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. She is an internationally recognized scholar in the areas of Dead Sea Scrolls the and the textual history of the Hebrew Bible. Her most recent book, Rewriting Scripture in Second Temple Times, explores the phenomenon of the reuse of biblical material in early Jewish literature. Her current project, a monograph entitled Scribes, Scrolls, and Scripture, love the title, uh, the story of Qumran, argues that Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, was founded as a library and scribal center in competition with the temple in Jerusalem, and that the manuscripts found in those caves are remnants of that library. Professor Crawford is the chair of the Board of Trustees of the W.F. Albright Institute of Archaeological Research in Jerusalem. She's a member of numerous editorial boards. At the University of Nebraska, she is the past chair of the Department of Classics and Religious Studies. She is currently serving as associate director of the Harris Center for Judaic Studies and as a member of the advisory committee for women's and gender studies. On tonight's topic, she is one of the world's premier experts and it's our honor to have her here. I will also add on a personal note. You know, in the course of your life, you, you meet people and your life is changed because of that. I would have to say that Sydney, I know her as Sydney, is one of those people for me. I am, I am indeed a fortunate person to have met her and, and through the many years and many different uh, opportunities worked together with her. So, Sydney, it's both for me a personal and a professional pleasure to have you here uh, addressing uh, my friends. So, thank you. Her topic tonight is What do the Dead Sea Scrolls teach us about the Bible? Please join me in welcoming Professor Sydney White Crawford. So tonight, my topic is the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Bible. As probably most of you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in caves in the Judean Desert region in what is today the West Bank and Israel. And so, we're not, well, it's a good thing I can move. See that area up there. <laughs> the largest collection of scrolls was found in the 11 caves around the site of Kirbit Qumran in the north, northwest corner of the Dead Sea. And so here is a cave, ma uh, cave map, and you can see Qumran up there at the top, and uh, then other scroll sites down along the Dead Sea, Wadi Marabaat, Nahal Hever, Nahal Selim, and Masada down there in the south. But tonight I will be talking mainly about the scrolls found in the vicinity of Qumran. This is the limestone cliff facade in which the first cave was located. And here is the, the cave itself. Um, you can see it, it's not a very hospitable kind of looking place, but this is indeed where the first seven scrolls that make up the Qumran scrolls were found. And those, any of you who have been to Israel, to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, and the Shrine of the Book, you know, you go in and on that sort of spindle is the copy of the Great Isaiah Scroll. And that was discovered in cave one. The biggest collection of scrolls was found in cave four, um, about, oh, 10,000 fragments that make up about 500 scrolls were found in cave four alone. And the last cave to be discovered in 1956 was cave 11. And cave 11 is the cave where the famous temple scroll was discovered. And here is that great Isaiah scroll that was found in cave one. Um, and um, it's a complete scroll of the book of Isaiah. All 66 chapters are there. It's a very, com it's a very intact scroll. 
Very little damage at the top, very little damage at the bottom. All of the leaves of the scroll are there. Feast your eyes on it because that's the last intact scroll you're going to see tonight. <laughs> This is more what the scrolls looked like, these little fragmentary things found in, uh, in Cave 4. And notice they were brought into the museum where they were kept in a cigar box. So that gives you a little idea of their size. So after all the sorting, compiling, counting, and editing was completed, about 25% of the manuscripts that were found in the Qumran caves were, all, were known to us from the Jewish canon of scripture. That is, they were biblical manuscripts. And so here you see all of the scrolls laid out in the scrollery where uh, the original team worked on them. And so about 25% of those manuscripts turned out to be biblical manuscripts. Now, probably again, this is a fact that all of you have heard at some point of, or another, that all the books found in the Jewish canon of, of scripture were found at Qumran with one exception, and that exception was the book of Esther. So you may be asking, well, why not Esther? Well. It could just be an accident, right? You saw these little fragmentary pieces. You know, maybe Esther originally was there, but just was never uncovered. Maybe the community there didn't like Esther very much. After all, Esther is kind of a strange book, isn't it? Doesn't mention God, has a lot of slaughtering in it, right? Um, so maybe they didn't like Esther. We know they didn't celebrate the holiday of Purim. So that may be it. Um, but I think a, a, a better question that the absence of Esther forces us to ask is, did they have the same Bible that we do today? Well, during the first decades of Qumran research, the fact that all of the books of the Hebrew Bible except Esther were found there was interpreted very simply. The assumption was made that the Jews living at Qumran had the same canon of scripture, the same Bible as Jews do today. They also had other religious literature that they read and copied and that too was discovered at Qumran. But their Bible was the same as it is today. Well, it's taken more than a generation of study of these manuscripts, both individually and as a collection, to realize that the picture is not so simple. This evening, I'm going to attempt to guide you through the evidence of the manuscripts and to demonstrate that our previous picture of what the Bible is and how the canon of scripture came to be is both complicate, complicated and clarified by the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, first, since I'm a professor, I want to start you off with some definitions. And you can feel free to take notes. So, uh, as you leave, there'll be a test, yes. <laughs> so the word Bible, it's a word that we take for granted, but it comes from the Greek ta biblia, which is a plural. It means the books, okay? So when you think of the Bible, you have to think it's not a book like, a, like you, know, you would find on the shelves of Barnes and Noble. Okay, but it's a collection of books, and in fact, it's kind, the term is, is an anachronism when it's applied to Qumran, because at the time of, the, of Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was no such thing as the codex, right, the book as we know it now. That was invented a century later, okay? So if there were, if there, whatever collection of scripture they had, it would have existed as separate scrolls. So 
each book would have had its own separate scroll and you would have had each book on the shelf and you would have pulled it out. That means that, for example, you couldn't open your Bible and look at the table of contents and figure out the order of scripture, right? Scripture maybe didn't have an order, okay? Um, and so, again, we, for, we have to start thinking a little differently about what that term Bible or scripture meant in the time of Qumran. And we already know that for different communities, it meant different things. There was a community of worshipers of the God of Israel, known as the Samaritans, whose sanctuary was located on Mount Gerizim in what is today the West Bank. And here is Mount Gerizim. Um, and they are known as the Samaritans, famous from the New Testament, from the rabbinic literature, and of course the Samaritan community continues to exist today. Well, for the Samaritans, the Bible simply consisted of the first five books of the Jewish Bible, the Torah or the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay. So the Samaritans have a very limited Bible or corpus of scripture. Jews today, on the other hand, have a much broader canon of scripture. They have the Torah, of course, but they also have all the books of the, pro of the prophets, the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, and then the, the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the book of the 12. And then they also have the writings, or Kituvim, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, etc. Okay, so the, the Jewish community has a much broader canon of scripture than the Samaritans. Christians have yet a broader canon of scripture. Protestant Christians take the Jewish Bible as their Old Testament with a slightly different order. And of course, they add the New Testament. However, oops, we're, we're a little off, but that top says Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches have the same Old Testament as the prophets, but they add the books of the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha are Jewish religious writings from the Second Temple period that became part of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of scripture, and thus became part of the Christian canon, because the Christians, of course, read their scripture in Greek. And so you have books like Tobit, Judith, the Septuagint version of Esther, which is longer than the Masoretic version, the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of Jesus ben Sira. He appears in the rabbinic corpus mentioned by the rabbis, but didn't make it into the Jewish canon of scripture. Baruch, uh, there's someone in this audience who's very fond of Baruch, uh, the uh, director of Judaic studies here. Uh, the letter of Jeremiah, the additions to Daniel. So there were a lot of other books, some of which became part of the Christian canon of scripture. Well, Orthodox and Slavonic churches add even more. They add First Esdras, the Prayer of Manasseh, Psalm 151, Third Maccabees. And if you're in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, you add even more, Jubilees and First Enoch. Now, why am I telling you all this? Just to make it clear that even today, when we use the word Bible, what is meant by that word is different for different communities of faith, right? Different faith communities have different Bibles, okay? So again, I'm gonna go back to the question, did 
The Qumran community, the Jewish community at Qumran, have the same Bible as Jews or canon of scripture as Jews do today. Well, one of the things we want to ask is how did this collection of literature become sacred scripture? When did it become the Bible? Who decided? That's the question of canon. Now, we don't start off with the Bible. We start off with sacred authoritative texts, which were individual works that religious communities acknowledge as having authority over the faith and practice of its members. Right? This book, we all think, has authority over us. And the canon is the collection of these individual sacred compositions, which are all written at different times by different authors. This collection, the canon, becomes authoritative and standard for defining orthodox religious beliefs and practices for the community. And the word community is very important here because it's the community of believers that has to accept a book as scripture, right? A book can sit there and say, I am authoritative, I am scripture, you should believe me, right? And if a community doesn't accept it, whoop, it doesn't mean anything, right? So. It used to be thought, so when we thought about canon in the Jewish community, right, the story was that the Jewish community, led by the rabbis, finalized their canon of scripture by the end of the first century CE, after the fall of the second temple in 70, at a place called Yavna. Now, because of the Qumran evidence, we have a, a more complicated picture. We realize that the process of scripture was a process. It was a process of canon in which eventually over a period of centuries, consensus was reached. So how did they reach consensus? How did they decide what books to accept? There's a nice picture of First Enoch, or not a nice. So here are the questions that we might want to ask if we want to find out if a community deems a book authoritative. Okay, Is that book, or parts of it, quoted authoritatively by other compositions? Or is it the subject of a separate commentary? Were there multiple copies of the book found? Okay. And does it present itself as scripture? Okay. So let's put those four questions to the collection of scrolls found at Qumran. Okay. First of all, Qumran literature constantly quotes other books as authoritative. And they, they don't, of course, use quotation marks like we would, but they'll say something like, as Moses said, or as it is written, or in Jeremiah, okay? And so it's clear they're quoting, and they're quoting it as authoritative. So here is, a, is an example from a Qumran document called the Damascus document, okay? This is in the Damascus document in column four. It says, if a man shall be caught in fornication twice by taking a second wife while the first is alive, whereas the principle of creation is male and female created he them. Okay, this is a clear quotation of Genesis chapter one, verse 27. Okay, and it's being used in a, in a law against divorce, okay, in the Damascus document. So that's pretty clear evidence that the, the, the community of the Damascus document thought Genesis was authoritative. And we find this all over the scrolls, right? They quote various books, okay. <clears throat> 
They also wrote books as, they wrote works that were commentaries on earlier books. Okay, and th these commentaries are called by the special name Pesharim, from the word Peshar, its interpretation is. But we found Peshar, Peshars at Qumran on the books of Habakkuk, the book of Nahum, Psalms, Isaiah, Micah, Zephaniah, and Malachi. So again, those books must have carried authority because they are commenting on them. They're giving new interpretations of them as authoritative. Okay. Multiple copies. Ah, there are lots of d copies of, of various books at Qumran. For example, 39 copies of the book of Deuteronomy were discovered. 39 copies of the book of Psalms were discovered. If you can say nothing else, you can say, well, they must have thought these were important, right? Because they're keeping them in multiple copies. So that's an indication that they thought probably they were authoritative. Now, on the other hand, there was one copy of the book of Chronicles found, two copies of Ezra Nehemiah, four copies of Song of Songs. Oh, they're not keeping those in multiple copies. What are we to make of that? They knew them, but they don't quote them authoritatively and they don't have multiple copies of them. That might raise a question in our minds, okay? Then if the book presents itself as authoritative, now how would you do that? Well, think of Deuteronomy, for example, right? Deuteronomy is, presents itself as a book that Moses speaks on the plains of Moab, right? Moses is speaking to the Israelites on the plains of Moab, and he's saying, here are the laws, O Israel, that you should obey. And then he gives them all the laws in chapters 12 through 26, right? Well, that's pretty authoritative, right? Okay, so obviously Deuteronomy wants you, the reader, to think of it as scripture. And the Jewish community, followed by the Christian community, in fact, accepts that and says, yes, this is scripture, right? But there's a book from Qumran, the Temple Scroll. Many of you probably have heard of it. It presents itself as the words of God spoken to Moses on Mount Sinai in the first person, right? God is speaking to Moses saying, I command you to do this. I command you to do that, right? Well, that sounds pretty authoritative, doesn't it? About as authoritative as you can get. If you opened a Bible today, would you find the temple scroll? No. <laughs> we only find it in three, possibly four copies at Qumran. Mm -hmm. It's never quoted authoritatively. It's certainly not commented on. So probably the temple scroll is one of those books that are saying, I'm authoritative, accept me, and the community went, I don't think so, right? So the temple scroll falls out of our knowledge until the discoveries at Qumran. So what, so what, are we, what, are, what does all this evidence show us? Okay, well, the evidence shows us, okay, that at Qumran, they may have had a, a corpus of authoritative texts. We don't want to yet call it a Bible, but a corpus of authoritative texts that has a different form than the Jewish Bible today. So I would say the Torah definitely, right? Multiple copies of all of the books of the Torah, okay? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? No question. Quotes them all authoritatively, no question. The prophets, probably, right? All of them, 
quotes Jeremiah, quotes Isaiah, quotes Ezekiel, has all those commentaries on the minor prophetic books, definitely the prophets. Then we get to the writings. Well, at Qumran, we find Psalms in 39 copies. That's a lot. Psalms is quoted authoritatively in other books. Psalms is the, the subject of a pesher, of a commentary. Psalms definitely. Proverbs. Well, Daniel. Yes, Daniel. Chronicles. One lousy little copy, little fragment actually like this. They never mention it. They don't seem to take any notice of it, whatever. Maybe not. Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, maybe. Ruth, Lamentations. We're getting into really questionable territory here. And so maybe, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Song of Song, Ecclesiastes, they may not have been authoritative at Qumran. They may not have accepted them. They knew them, but maybe they didn't think they were particularly special. Maybe they, they only became authoritative in Judaism later. Okay, but what about some other books, okay? What about, for example, 1st Enoch? Remember, First Enoch is part of the Ethiopian Orthodox canon of scripture. Well, First Enoch was found in 12 copies at Qumran. That's a whole lot more than First Chronicles. It was found in its original language, which is Aramaic. The figure of Enoch is a figure of central importance in the theology and writings preserved by the community. Enoch is mentioned constantly. Okay. The astronomical book, which is part of the book of Enoch, was the basis for the lunisolar calendar that they seem to have followed at Qumran. Enoch probably had scriptural authority in the Qumran community even though later it didn't have scriptural authority in the Jewish community. Now, here's an interesting little fact. The book of Enoch is quoted as authoritative in the letter of Jude in the New Testament. Now, many of you may never have heard of the letter of Jude because it's a pretty obscure letter in the back of the New Testament that's only a page or two long, but trust me, it's there. And if you go and you read it, it's quoting Enoch. What does that indicate? Well, it indicates that there was some Christian writer in the late first century that thought Enoch was was authoritative as well, which is an interesting little connection that we can draw. Okay, so Enoch, Jubilees, another one of those canonical books in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Well, Jubilees we find in 14 or 15 copies, depending on how you count, in its original language, Hebrew, in the caves of Qumran. It's quoted as an authority in that Damascus document. Here it is in column 16. As for the exact determination of their times to which Israel turned a blind eye, behold, it is strictly defined in the book of the divisions of the times into their jubilees and weeks. There it is, quoted as authoritative. So jubilees was probably part of their authoritative scriptures. Psalm 151. Psalm 151 appears in the book of Psalms in the Septuagint form, the Greek translation, and therefore is part of the, the uh, Christian canon of scripture in the Roman Catholic and Orthodox denominations. But it's also found at Qumran in Psalm scrolls. Okay? And so they probably accepted it as part of 
the overall corpus of psalms, and it was just as authoritative a psalm as Psalm 2. Okay? So it's, it's obvious that the Qumran community had a different corpus of sacred scripture from that which became the canon in later Judaism. So that's one thing that the Dead Sea Scrolls taught us about the Bible, that what we had thought was the canon as, as far back as the return from exile, we thought that was it, that was their canon, turns out to be more in flux all the way down through the Second Temple period into the second and third century CE. And the Qumran corpus is, is hard evidence for this. So that's the question of canon. The next question that the Qumran corpus raises for us is the question of the text, the actual words of the books of scripture. Now, I would guess that most of us think that when we open a Bible, or if we unroll a scroll of the Torah, right, that the words that we see are the same words that have been there for centuries, and that will be there, and they, you don't change them, and <coughs> you don't put in additions or anything else, that's it. And okay, people do read it in translation, and we know translations can differ, but the underlying Hebrew, that's fixed. It doesn't change. That's what we thought, right, was always the case until we went, until we really looked at the Qumran discoveries. And what we discovered is that the text of the Bible underwent the same process of stabilization as the canon did. Now, prior to Qumran, we already knew that different textual forms of the books of scripture existed. All right? There was the Masoretic text, which is the canonical text of Judaism. Right? That is the text of scripture in Judaism. But there existed the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And there were differences between the Masoretic text and the Greek text that probably pointed to inner, inner Hebrew differences. Okay? And then the Samaritan Pentateuch, which was the canonical text of the Samaritan community, had a different text from the Masoretic text in the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy. But most scholars thought, OK, yeah, we see these differences, but really the Masoretic text is, is the stable set text, and these other texts are just kind of deviant, right? OK, that's what everyone thought. Then we get to Qumran. And we find evidence for all sorts of variation among these different texts. And I'm going to give you some examples of the kinds of variation we find. Now, one of the things you need to remember when we, as we look at this is that all the manuscripts at Qumran were hand copied. Now, that's, yes, Sydney, thank you very much for pointing that out. That seems kind of obvious. But you have to remember, when you copy manuscripts by hand, mistakes creep in, right? It's just, you know, humans make errors. And often, they would catch them and they would fix them, but sometimes they didn't. And when a mistake got into a text, then the next scribe who came along would copy the mistake and it would go along. You kind of think of it as genetic, right? So there are those simple kind of errors. But then, there are what we call real variants. That is when you have two different texts and you can't explain of the variation between them as a result of error or mistake, right? There's, there actually is a variant here and you have to decide if you can which is earlier. <coughs> 
So here's an example of a real variant, okay? And this is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 8. And the Masoretic text, and obviously I'm giving you the translation here, reads, he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel, the B'nai Yisrael, okay? In the Septuagint, the text read, he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, the Huion Theu, right, the sons of God. Now, that, that's a variant, right? We, we can't, it's, an, it's not a mistake, right? There are two different readings here, and you have to decide whether one or the other is earlier. Now, in, among the Deuteronomy manuscripts of Qumran, one manuscript, 4Q Deuteronomy J, 4 stands for K4, Q stands for Qumran, Deuteronomy, and then J is the letter assigned to identify it. 4Q Deuteronomy J reads, he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God the B'nai Elohim, okay? So suddenly we have a, um, a, a Hebrew manuscript coming from the late first century BCE that has the same reading as the Septuagint. And so we know that these are two Hebrew readings and now it's up to the text critic to decide which is older. Now, I think the reading Sons of God, B'nai Elohim is older, and maybe you want to ask me why in the question period, but I won't bore you right now, okay? But that's an example of a real variant, and, it's, and here we have suddenly Qumran evidence to back up our Septuagint evidence. Okay, so that's one kind of variant. Now, there's an even larger, and here's a, here's a, well, this isn't such a great picture, I apologize. This is a, a, a manuscript that, of 4Q Deuteronomy G, that is an almost exact copy, where it exists, of the Masoretic text, okay? So there are some that are just like the Masoretic text, some that are like the Septuagint, some that are like the Samaritan Pentateuch, they're all there. This is a manuscript, 4Q Deuteronomy N, that has the kind of variant that is called a harmonizing variant. And a harmonizing variant is when two different forms of the same thing exist and a scribe brings them together into harmony. Okay, and let me show you how this works. Here is the fourth commandment from the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, in the book of Exodus. And you'll all, this will be familiar to all of you, right? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. So the commandment is given to rest on the Sabbath day, and the reason for that is because of, the, the, of God's resting after the work of creation, as we find in Genesis. Okay, now... There's a second place in the Pentateuch where the Ten Commandments appear, and that's in the book of Deuteronomy, okay? And so this is the fourth commandment as it appears in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns. 
so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Same commandment, keep the Sabbath day, but the reason now is different, right? We might say this is more of a historical rather than a theological reason. So because you were slaves, you should give your servants rest, you know, as you wanted rest, okay? So same commandment, different reasons. Now, this is what the manuscript 4Q Deuteronomy N says when it comes to the fourth commandment. Observe the Sabbath day to sanctify it, according as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do in it any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, your ox or your ass or your beast, your sojourner who is in your gates, in order that your male servant and your female servant might rest like you. And remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you forth from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day to sanctify it. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all which is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Well, that's a really long fourth commandment, right? But it's pretty obvious what the scribe has done, right? The scribe of this manuscript, probably, or maybe an earlier manuscript, that there were two versions of that fourth commandment and he's harmonized them, he's brought them together, okay? Now, that particular example of harmonization only exists in this one manuscript, right? We didn't know about it before the Qumran examples. So is it original? Probably not, right? Probably very unlikely that that it was one long commandment and then it got torn apart, right? It's much more likely that you had two different versions and a scribe brought them together. So, so there are these kind of harmonizations. And in the Samaritan Pentateuch version of the Pentateuch, you find a systematically harmonized text. Like scribes went through and said, oh, well, you know, in Exodus it talks about the death of Aaron, but then when you get to Deuteronomy, Moses says something different about it. Let's bring them together, right? So the Samaritan Pentateuch actually is a longer text than the Torah as found in the Masoretic text because it does a lot of these harmonizing kind of things. Now, and that's very interesting in and of itself, but what we find at Qumran is manuscripts that have this harmonized version. Well, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the Samaritans didn't do that, that that kind of harmonized text was more common in Palestine in the Greco-Roman period than just in the Samaritan community, right? It was more common in the Jewish community, and clearly the people who lived at Qumran thought it was just as valuable, just as authoritative a text, as the text that we would now say is just like the Masoretic text. That's really very interesting. Okay, let me give you another example. This is from a manuscript called 4Q365, that's the number of the text. Its name is 4Q Reworked Pentateuch C. And you can tell by its name, right, kind of what scholars thought of this text. When it was first discovered, the original scholars, seven scholars who were responsible for publishing the scrolls, as they figured out what these fragmentary manuscripts were, they would divide them up, right? They all had areas of expertise. So Frank Moorcross and Patrick Skeen got the biblical texts, and uh, Millick, but John Starkey got the Aramaic texts, and J.T. Millick got the um, 
the texts like Enoch and things like that. And then John Allegro and John Strugnell were getting texts that were not, that hadn't been known before. And this version of the Pentateuch came up and they said, oh, well, it's biblical. You know, you, you cross and ski and you get it. And cross and ski and started uh, studying this thing and they said, this isn't biblical. This is just a paraphrase. And so they punted it over to John Strugnell, and he called it Pentateuchal Paraphrases. Well, in the 1990s, a new set of editors, Emmanuel Tobin and myself, looked at this manuscript and they said, well, it's not really a paraphrase, but it's not like any other Pentateuch that we've seen before. We're going to call it reworked Pentateuch. Okay, so that's why it's called that. Now, why did we call it that? Okay, well the reason is that it's a harmonized text like the Samaritan Pentateuch. Well that's okay because we knew they existed. So that's still Pentateuch. But this reworked part came because in addition to the harmonizations, there, the, the scribe or scribes added new material. Right, just from wherever, right? And put it into the Pentateuch. And we thought, wow, this is strange. So here's an example of that. And this is from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 15. And those of you who remember Exodus, I know you all are thinking, oh, Exodus 15, I remember it well, right? Exodus 15 is, is right after the Israelites have crossed the Red Sea and Moses sings, sings his song in praise of God, right? Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, he's thrown into the sea, and then the song goes on. And then at the end of that chapter, it says, and then Miriam, the sister of Moses, took up her timbrel and led out the women of Israel, and she sang, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, he is thrown into the sea. And then it stopped. Well, the rabbis, they, they, they talk about this and they say, well, I wonder if Miriam sang anymore. Well, lo and behold, in 4Q365, after Exodus 15, chapter, uh, verse 21, where it says, then Miriam the prophet, sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dancing and Miriam sang to them and then the text breaks off, and at the top of the next column, we have this new fragmentary song that Miriam seems to have sung. You despised for the majesty of, you know, we're only getting fragments of lines, but you are great, a deliverer. The hope of the enemy is perished, and he is forgotten. They perished in the mighty waters, the enemy. Extol the one who raises up. Praise the one who does gloriously. So it's obviously a, a hymn of praise to God. And then the text carries on with Exodus. And Moses traveled with Israel from the sea, and they walked in the desert of Shur three days, but they did not find water. Okay, so this has been plunked into that spot in Exodus. And we thought to ourselves, oh, well, this can't be a real Pentateuch then, right? Because who would add material into the Pentateuch? Boy, were we wrong, right? Because what we found out is that, in fact, they did these things. And that this book probably at least was meant to be thought of as a Pentateuch, right? Just as a Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy, with an expanded text. But the same as all other books of the Pentateuch. Um, but by that time, it was too late. Its name is 4Q Rework Pentateuch, and it's going to stay that way. So, so those are examples of, of variation within the text. And we find ex examples like that all through the Qumran corpus of what we call biblical books, right? So we already know now that the text of scripture was for them much more fluid than it is for us, right? It could change, it could have variance, and it was still scripture for them.